everything in our society revolves around gathering more for ourselves. I'm not speaking of the, the need for money to survive or, or retirement plans or anything like that, but I'm saying the appetite for more. I need more. I need to gather more. I need to collect more is what defines our culture today. But if you've seen the TV show Hoarders, uh, you understand this. E- each show documents people who are uh, have the problem of hoarding. They, they collect and collect to the point where they have no more space in their home. And, and if you've seen the show, much of what, almost all of what they collect is what we would call garbage. It, it's, it's worthless. It's, it's stuff to be thrown out, but yet they continue to collect and hoard things. Even the remains of former pets that they lost and couldn't find that were hiding and died behind stacks and stacks of trash. Their families and organizational experts and psychologists come in and try to help the hoarder to see the danger of what they're doing. Some people's houses will be condemned. Others who are renting will be evicted. And families get involved and the family members are forced to clean out the mess. Now, These hoarders are hoarding things that are of no value. It may be to them, but not to anyone else. But it's not just those who collect trash in their home that builds up and up that have a problem. Because what we see in James chapter 5 and what we see in other passages in Scripture is that hoarding of anything is wrong. It's sinful at its root. And here... What James is talking about to the dispersed believers, the Jewish Christians that have been dispersed out of Jerusalem, what he's saying to them is that hoarding of wealth is sin. See, we know that hoarding of, no, of things with no value makes no sense, but what about money? Some have tried to create wealth through illegal means like Bernie Madoff a stockbroker who created a system of of false trading reports. He would give clients quotes on their portfolio using past dates, which would allow him to keep the gains and deposit them in his account, and billions were stolen using the scam, all because one man wanted more. What he had wasn't good enough. This mentality doesn't just happen with the extremely wealthy, though, does it? It happens with regular folks like us. About a decade ago, there was a push, actually probably 20 years ago, there was a push to get people into home ownership. And it got to the point where people who were not qualified were getting loans, and when the loans came due or the payments stopped coming in, everything fell apart. This combined with a mania for home ownership, increased loans to unqualified buyers, and a growing popularity of house flipping caused the recession that began in 2007. Some cities, even to the point where if you would drive just a few years later through cities, and we did through Phoenix, you would see neighborhood after neighborhood of houses that were halfway finished, where the builders went bankrupt. All because, for good reasons and for bad reasons, people wanted more. More than they could purchase. More than what they had. They wanted more. This is our culture. What you have, the culture says, what you have is not enough. You do not have enough money, so you need to do this, this, and this. You do not have a big enough house. You do not have a new enough car. You do not have the wealth and prestige that you deserve, so here's how to get it. All sounds nice, doesn't it? Who doesn't want more? Who wouldn't welcome more in their life? This is no different than what James was talking about. The more money that people wanted came at a cost, often in this young church, it came at a cost of the benefit of others. And James is warning us, he's saying, this is wrong, this is sinful. You can't abuse others, you can't take from others in order to hoard your wealth. 
See, this is hard for Christians, isn't it? We live in two worlds simultaneously. In one sense, we live in our Christian culture where we come to church, where our friends are believers, where we we have family members that love the Lord. And on the other sense, we go to work with people who don't. We go to school with those who don't. We live in neighborhoods with people who don't love the Lord. We live in two distinct cultures. And with every question that we face, specifically with money here today, Every question that we face, we have to go back to Scripture and say, what does the Bible say? Because what the culture is telling you is that you don't have enough. You need more. More will make you happier. More will bring you peace. More will bring you joy and contentment. If you only had more, life would be better. That's what the world's trying to feed us. What does the Bible say? What does God say through his word? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If James 5, 1 through 6, was written, if it was never part of Scripture, and you wrote that letter to me, and I read that, I would probably not enjoy it too much. The truth is, I don't particularly enjoy much of what James has to say because it's convicting. I, I don't like being told that I'm wrong, right? None of us do. And here, in this passage in James, if you didn't know that it was part of Scripture, you would think, man, this is, this is not good. I don't like this. Upton Sinclair, the novelist and social reformer, quoted this passage from James in one of his books, but he changed it enough that people wouldn't quite get the point or see that it was part of Scripture. But the meaning that he wrote still remained the same. He was trying to show in his terminology that being rich is not so much wrong, but the abuse that so many people have committed, especially in the Hebrew church, that's where the sin comes in. Sinclair was no Christian, but he was trying to say that James' critique of those who hoarded their wealth was applicable in his day, in our day, as it is in James's day. Suppose for a second that I as a pastor got up and read this to you and I said this, come now you ultra rich, cry for how much you're being taxed. Your riches are rotten and all your fancy clothes too. The extravagances of your wealth will soon be gone and so will you. You have put your hope in what you own and it will all burn. You've taken advantage of your workers by not paying them a fair wage. You've stolen from them. You've lived in luxury, eaten the best food while your workers starve. Now, you would hear that, most of us would hear that, and say, that sounds more like Bernie Sanders than it does the Bible. But what is James saying to us? It doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see the indignation and the anger that was raging in the hearts of those who read this for the first time. Especially those who were guilty of what James is saying that they were doing. You're abusing your employees. You're getting rich and getting uh, fat and happy off the backs of these people who you're abusing. He's not saying there's a problem of having wealth. He's saying that there's a problem with how those, some of those people got their wealth. He's saying that's not Christian behavior. That's not godly behavior. That's not behavior that will honor and glorify God. But he was writing to Hebrews. He was writing to Jewish people who would have remembered the Old Testament. They would have remembered Micah 2, where it says, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work on evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet and seize them in houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Amos 5, we, we see a similar warning from God. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of gain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many of you your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy at the gate. And in that same chapter of Amos 5, we see this. God says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. 
Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Some would reject the words of James outright, and there's been criticisms throughout church history of James's letter. But most of the negativity towards James, especially here, just because it just doesn't sound very nice. It doesn't sound nice to condemn someone to say that what you're doing is wrong. He, he actually sounds more here like an Old Testament prophet, doesn't he? What he wrote here would fit perfectly in Micah and Amos and all of the other prophets who condemned those people who were abusing others. Those people who were chosen by God to be his people, yet they abused others for selfish gain. And this leads us to what we see in verse 1 is a warning. This warning to the unrighteous rich is to weep and howl for the miseries that are coming to them. Their materialism has taken them over to the point that they are dominated, they are defined by their desire for more. That's all they're consumed by. Micah, woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. What Micah is saying is that their wickedness, their, their push to get more at the cost of hurting others, they are thinking about that as they're laying in bed at night. It means that they are so consumed that the, every single thought that they have is about taking something from others and hoarding it for themselves. James is saying too, that there were some in these early churches, these Jewish believers, who were doing the exact same thing that Amos and Micah warned us about. So some of you naturally are probably thinking, well, then is it wrong to be rich? Is it wrong to have wealth? Uh, well, we know that Abraham and Job and David and, and so many people and Solomon, uh, they were wealthy beyond anything any of us could even imagine. So we know that God bless them. And we know from our lives today that, that some believers have, have been blessed by God so that they could give to others. And without people with wealth, churches would suffer financially. Missionaries would be sent home. And families in need in the local churches would go with their needs unmet. So nowhere in the Bible does it say that being wealthy or having money is a sin. 1 Timothy 6 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. For if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For a verse, by the way, that's misquoted, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evils. That's what, that's what I grew up hearing, that money is the root of all evil, so stay, you know, live humbly. Wanting to save for retirement is not a sin. Wanting to have a job that pays well is not a sin, but it can be. This is what I've been preaching for so long. These things that, that we, we call sin or that we can label as sin, often they don't begin as sin, do they? They begin as something good. God created these things for our good, for our blessing, for our betterment. And yet we figure out ways to twist them and make them into something that doesn't glorify God. And in fact, it makes us to be the king. It makes us to be God. Something that God created, we create it and make it an idol. And so money certainly is not sinful, but it can lead us to ruin. In Matthew 6, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, or, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. And only a few verses later, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
You remember the story of Jesus and the, the rich man, the young man who comes to Jesus and, and says, the best question that any person can ever ask, it's the best question in Scripture, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How we would give anything for people to come to us. Someone knocks on your door and says, I don't know you, but what must I do to inherit eternal life? Like, I don't even know if anybody can speak. Our jaws, would, we'd have to pick them up off the floor, right? But this man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus, knowing the man's heart, he says, he gives him the law. And the man, the man says, well, hey, I've done it. I've kept the law. I've obeyed the law. And then Jesus could look inside the man and he says something the man never wanted to hear. He listen, he says, you must sell all your possessions, give all the things that you have, give all the proceeds to the poor, and then your treasure will be found in heaven. And then he says, come follow me. And the young man didn't like what he had heard. He turned and walked away. And then just Jesus says right after that, he says this, he looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Nowhere does it say that having money is a sin. But he is saying that anyone who trusts in riches, anyone who puts their value in what they have or what they do or what they own or how good they are cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It is impossible because our loyalty cannot be split. We may reside in the kingdom of the world right now, but we do not belong to that. We are not citizens of this world. We cannot hold divided loyalties. Either our lives are devoted to God and to, uh, or to ourselves and to our possessions. There are only two options here. And so the question for all of us is where do we place our trust? Is our hope and trust in Jesus Or is it in what we have, our money, our possessions? Are we like the the rich young man? Are we uh, unwilling to give up everything for the cause of Christ? Are we unwilling to do that? Or do we say, everything I own is because of God in the first place, and everything I own belongs to him already? In verses 2 and 3, we see the reality of this situation. We are conditioned, brainwashed maybe, to believe that if we only had more, we would be better off. If, if our salary was just a little bit higher, we'd be happy. And so the question is, what, what is that number? Is it 100,000, 500,000, a million? What is that number for you that you would say, if I only had this, I'd be happy? Well, in 2010, A scientific journal published a study to see actually where happiness peaks. Now, this was 2010, and it says the the questions that they researched was, at what level of income does happiness level off? Now, we probably assume that that's well into six figures. 250? 500? At what point does the salary not affect your happiness anymore? They did see that increased salary does help. Certainly, it takes away a lot of the stress that we have. So for someone to go from 40,000 to 80,000 is huge. A lot of those stressors that we have go away. But here's what they found in 2010. Once people earned $75,000 per year, extra pay did not statistically improve their level of happiness. Once someone made over 75000 their happiness either stayed the same or it decreased. Now, adjusted for inflation, 75000 is about 100000 today. And similar surveys recently have shown the same thing. Once someone's salary reaches about $100,000, 
There's no more happiness that comes from that salary. See, we're conditioned to want more. We're conditioned to to desire more, so much so that it takes control of our hearts. Our passions and our desires are no longer found in what is good for the kingdom of God, but rather what is good for my future. And the studies show that higher income does not bring happiness. See, we're instructed at an early age to hoard And James writes in verses 2 and 3, Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. It's not the accumulation of wealth that James has a problem with. It's hoarding so that we or whoever can live a life of pleasure while other people suffer. And James is writing to a church, so we need to understand this. James is saying this is happening in the church, amongst Christians. That there are people in the Christian community, in in, in a church, that are collecting and hoarding money, often as we'll see soon, off the backs of others, while other people in that community are suffering and starving and have nothing. See, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that the things we own or the things that we want to own, they're not really that important. We've all heard it said, you can't take it with you when you die. And as a pastor, I've sat next to people who who are dying or who know that they're going to die, people who are are in a hospital that they know the end is coming soon. And I've, I've sat with them. And you know what I've never heard one time? I've never heard, and I don't ever think that I will hear this, man, if I just had more money. If I just had that car that I wanted, gosh. Man, my house, gosh, I wish it could have been a little bit bigger. Never have I heard that, and never will I hear that. You know what I hear? I wish that I would have served the Lord more. Or I'm so grateful what the God has done in my life. I'm so thankful for my family. I wish that I would have spent more time with them. I wish that I would have told them I love them. I wish I would have kissed them more. I wish I would have given more hugs. Those are the things that I hear. Because at the end of our lives, money doesn't matter. Possessions don't matter. But the problem is when we make that our heart, when we make what we have, what we earn, who we are, and make that an idol in our lives, it consumes us and it kills our soul from the inside. And so we have to ask ourselves, what legacy are we leaving as Christians? What James is saying in these verses is that those who are hoarding wealth with no thought of Christ or his kingdom are sinful because it's disregarding what God has said to do inside the church to care for the people who are hurting and the people who are hungry. They've ignored the tenets of the Christian faith that is far more concerned with others than we are with ourselves. This, in essence, is denying Christianity's claims. So we've seen the warning and we've seen the reality. Now let's look at the reasons. This is verses 4 through 6. James gives us three reasons for his serious warning. The first thing these wealthy hoarders have done is withholding wages. Verse 4. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. They're crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. These businessmen were hiring people, gathering the bounty, and not paying their workers. Now, if we owned a business, that'd be really nice, right? Free labor is wonderful. We we all would love to have people work for us for free, and we don't have to give them anything. But it's another thing altogether, especially for a believer, to refuse to give someone what they're worth. This is... Ebenezer Scrooge before he met the ghosts, right? That, that he, he refused to increase pay. He, he didn't even want to put an extra piece of coal in the fire to heat up the office. So what happens? 
James says these workers are crying out against these criminal hoarders. It should remind us of of Abel and his voice crying out from the grave for what Cain did to him. These workers cry out to God and he hears them. Now this is a side note again, but I want you to know that God hears you when you're suffering. This is another verse among many that we see that those who are on the that James is not talking specifically to, he's talking to the rich, but those people who are suffering, those workers who weren't paid, those people who were abused, their voices cried out and God heard them. God hears you. When you're suffering, when you're at the lowest point, when you're abused, when you're hurt, or whatever it may be, God hears your cries. And the gospel reminds us That all sin will be dealt with. So listen, even those people who were abusing those people, the the people that James talks about, those, those businessmen who were abusing their workers by not paying them a wage that they were worth, those people who were getting rich off the backs of the people, those people cried out, God heard them. And listen, even if God doesn't deal with it in this life, eternity will, it will be dealt with. That the sins that other people have committed against us, they will be dealt with. They will be eliminated, whether it's through them suffering eternity in hell or if it's on the the cross with Christ. All sin will be vanquished and dealt with. And so God hears your cries. God hears your voice. So the first reason for James' rebuke is that the believers withheld wages from their employees. They were abusing them. God saw it. The second reason that James gives is one of self-indulgence. Look at verse 5. You have lived on the earth and in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now this didn't really happen. Most historians say that this didn't happen. But Marie Antoinette um, made a comment as the people who were going through a, a shortage of food, they, they were screaming out, again, this probably didn't happen, but they were screaming out, we want bread. And the, the, uh, the old tale says that Marie Antoinette, um, in her, uh, she had more than enough food. She said, well, let them eat cake. And you know, bread, let, just, why don't you just go eat cake? Not understanding that there was no food for anybody. And this attitude, though, is not just found in royalty. In James' day, there are those who hoard their wealth when people all around them are starving. See, here is what tells me, James says this, what tells me where your heart is is what you do. He also says faith without works is dead, which means that if we say that we have faith, but we don't exhibit that faith, then our faith is really non-existent. And so what you do, how you react, what you do with what God has given to you tells a lot about what your heart believes. So if we hoard our wealth, if we hoard our things and we do not give them away, we do not bless others with them, we're guilty. It's showing that our heart belongs to something else. And we're fighting that battle of two masters Finally, the third reason that James gives his rebuke is their oppression of the righteous. Verse 6. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. This refers to the wealthy who had taken away the means of someone else to make a living. It's not directly murdering someone, but it's removing their ability to earn a living. We see this in underhanded and unethical business practices. And James is saying, this got to stop, guys. This, this is a, a church. These are believers. We've got to treat each other better. So the question before us is, where do our riches lie? Do we place our hope and trust in money, in wealth, in our possessions, in our retirement? See, it's easy to be consumed by this. It is so easy to be consumed. And the older that we get, the more we think about it. At 20, I didn't give a, a thought on retirement. Right. At 41, it's a little more serious. At 81, it's much more serious. And it is so easy for us to be consumed by these things because it's a stressor. But where is our heart? 
Where, is our, our, where are our motives? What, what causes us to do what we do? Material possessions are celebrated by many around us, but being successful and having loads of money is looked upon as a virtue. But what happens when we invest our life in the pursuit of money and possessions? What does it show the world about our priorities and where our heart really is? Jesus was very clear. If you are part of his family, if you are part of the Christian faith, you cannot serve money. But if you are not part of the Christian family, this makes, makes sense, right? We, we gain wealth. We have a better life. We, we get to a point where we can truly be happy. We worship at the altar of money. And so, Naturally, what we do, because God's created us to worship, this is our primary means, is to worship God. That's why we are here. That's why we were created, is to give God the worship that he deserves. And what happens is, when we do not worship the one true God, when we do not do what he has said to do, there is a hole, and we try to fill that hole with everything else other than the one thing that will fit. And so we know that there's this emptiness in our hearts and so many people will, will try to gather it through, through relationships or through wealth or through prestige or through power. And all the time they're trying to fill their lives with something that it was never created to be filled with. None of those things will satisfy us. None of them. And yet we as people continually try to fill that hole in our hearts with everything but God. And James says that what you have been doing or what some people have been doing is going after money. Stomping all over other people in order to gain wealth. Wealth is not the problem. We are grateful for wealthy people who can support churches and missionaries and Christian ministries all over. We love the fact that God has blessed some people with enormous wealth in order to give it away, to be a blessing to others. And James is saying some people were not doing that. They were hoarding wealth for themselves, not to be a blessing to other people. These things of, of comfort and, and, and fame, these are not wrong things, but they show what controls our hearts. If that's you, I want you to hear this. Please understand that God created you for more than that. You are not living your best life now if you're going after money. If your heart is consumed by anything other than God, it will not satisfy. You're created with a purpose, and that is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that can only happen when you place your desires and your passions and your dreams at the foot of the cross. You turn from your sins and you give your entire life to Christ. All of it. Every thought every desire, every passion, and every penny. God cares about your money, but not the same way that so many people do. He wants you to surrender your wealth and success so that he can use it to bring himself glory. All that we have has been given to us by God. And God is saying to us, I want to see what your heart really is. I want to see what motivates you. I want to see what moves you. I want to see what brings you life. And this is hard for a lot of us to hear. But the gospel of Christ says that what we want doesn't really matter. What matters is our obedience to what God has prescribed for us. As the old hymn says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless Look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Would you pray with me?